everybody. As she said, my name is John Madley, and I'm the founder of Shodan. This is the uh, third year I've been here. And I was invited to speak this time not as much about ICS, exposure on the internet, but rather IoT, which is you know, sort of our primary focus, actually. And you know, just quickly, I think we've all been hearing about you know, ICS, seeing more attacks, things like that. And regardless of, at least from our perspective, we don't know how to validate that. But we can see that there's definitely been an interest, a growing interest, in sort of the ICS protocols. So we know more people are starting to look at it from outside the ICS community. Here is a chart that I took of um, the number of questions that regular developers are asking on Stack Overflow, which is one of the most popular Q&A sites for developers. And here you can see how over time, more and more developers are getting interested in the ecosystem and starting to ask questions. But beyond ICS, if you've been following the most recent news, we've seen a new type of botnet arise, or it's allegedly new, uh, the Mirai botnet. And this is a chart showing the size of the DDoS attacks over time. And you know, initially, a few years ago, it wasn't that bad. Then in 2013, there was a sizable jump due to the NTP reflection attacks. I don't know whether there is a causation, but 2013 was also the year where stateless scanning with ZMAP and mass scan became more popular. Um, I don't know whether there's any causation, but there's definitely something happening. And then this year, a giant explosion where you know, some guy discovered that you can use all these embedded devices to launch a DDoS attack. And so I want to start off by saying, you know, how do we get here? What happened? How does the internet look like right now? So to get a better understanding of what the internet represents right now, I want to show a broad distribution of devices, just to give you a, a basic understanding of what we're looking at on the internet right now. So I have on one side, I have the most popular services in Sweden. And on the right side, I have the most popular services around the world. As you'd expect, a lot of web servers, no surprise. Uh, CWMP is a protocol used by modems to update themselves. A lot of ISPs use it, very popular. Um, in Sweden, you can see it's a bit different because the VPN protocols, Ike, IKT, and PPTP, these are all protocols used for VPNs, make the top 10 in Sweden. They don't make the top 10 worldwide. And then, so Telnet here on a random port, I don't know what this is, but worldwide, the Telnet port is the number 10 most popular service. Right? Fortunately, it's behind SSH. A few years ago when I gave this talk, SSH was still behind Telnet. Now it's ahead, so you know, go team. It's gotten better. Um, but still, just to give you, Telnet is still incredibly common. Right? I mean, if you know the Mirai, it's not too surprising, but still makes the top 10, which is interesting to me. Also briefly, I want to talk about you know, IPv6. We have some data on it. It is currently very biased because with IPv6, we can't guarantee sort of uniform distribution. It's very biased towards CDNs and certain net blocks. So take this kind of with a grain of salt, but right now, IPv6, we're mostly seeing web servers and, and DNS on various random ports. I also looked at Sweden's um, HTTPS usage. So you can tell here that Sweden is responsible for 0.46% of the HTTPS servers around the world. However, it is responsible for 0.62% of SSL v2 and 0.88% of Heartbleed. What's going on, Sweden? Why, why are you like you know, almost twice as much? This is a very odd distribution. So I don't know what's going on. I looked at the results here, actually, because I was a bit confused. I did, sometimes when you see these discrepancies, there's like one hosting provider that screwed up deployment. But uh, this is a list of domain names for the servers that are vulnerable to Heartbleed. And what surprised me in Sweden is that it's actually very broadly distributed. You know, there's a lot of Telia, which I'm, I think is a very popular ISP or probably the biggest one. Uh, but I looked at the servers, and there wasn't anything common. So just Lots of web servers in Sweden that are still vulnerable to Heartbleed. And that brings me to the first topic I wanted to cover. So I'm, I'm talking about IoT, I'm talking about you know, the rise of the machines. But I want to start off with talking about the developers. 
Because to me, that's one of the critical aspects of all the problems we're seeing with IoT. If you're not that familiar with you know, modern software development, which maybe many people here aren't, um, one of the recent things we've seen happen is an explosion of programming languages that are available. You know, for a long time, we only had PHP, maybe Python to some degree in Ruby. For the past few years, we've seen a lot more languages, a lot more ecosystems and frameworks develop. One of them is Node.js, which I want to highlight here, because a story like this came out. So it turns out that there was a library in Node.js that was so critical, used by almost every project in a Node ecosystem, a super important module. Um, and the developer of it got pissed off that somebody was trying to take over the name of his like, module, his library name. And so he took it off the official rep repository, the public repository for Node modules. And in the process, he broke pretty much everything out there in the Node ecosystem, because everything depended on it. So when he pulled it off, people were screwed. And this is the module that was so critical, everybody had to use it. It's a bit small, potentially. This is a function. The module is a single function that is responsible for padding a string on the left side. So if you don't understand this, this is adding white space on the left side of a string. This is super important. I mean, look, there's like a cache of, of white space. This is like, this is crazy, right? There's no reason you need to have a dependency on this. But it turns out the whole Node ecosystem is like that. You know, on average, a Node project has like a few hundred dependencies, and a lot of them are like this. So it's extremely fragile. But the idea is that as a developer, you don't need to reinvent anything. I mean, anything at all. The most simplest function is available as a library. The other thing that we've been seeing a show, Dan, is stories like this. This is not some uh, story where somebody compromised the network and stole data. This is a story of somebody deployed a database on a public internet without authentication, and somebody found it and downloaded all the data. It's really like, an, an obvious error. There's no, nothing fancy going on here. It's just, to me, a result of this DevOps trend that we've had in the developer community where you don't need to have a system administrator anymore. You don't need to have a guy managing your servers. Why would you? You just outsource everything to the cloud, right? I mean, nowadays, the solution to any startup is you take Amazon and you smack somebody's NoSQL products on it, and you're good to go. And all these images are already made for you. You don't need to worry about that. Amazon is the cloud that takes care of you. So we've been abstracting a lot of the security aspects that we historically took care of ourselves to the cloud as a cost-saving measure and an ease of deployment, ease of scalability. But when you actually look at the images that people are using in the cloud, this is a breakdown of the vulnerabilities in the default images that people use or are available on Docker. So 40% uh, of all the images available have a high priority vulnerability in them. And 75% have a medium, at least, priority vulnerability. So if you're using an image that's already out there, statistically speaking, you're going to be vulnerable by default. So you need to build your own images, which practically nobody does, unless you care about security, and then you're probably not doing it this way anyway. And one reason I also want to talk about the cloud aspect of things is because for IoT, a lot of vendors are pushing everything to the cloud. It's sort of, it goes hand in hand that you have embedded devices and you have the cloud and they talk together and it makes scaling very easy. Everything is sort of this magically, you know, perfect solution. But when you look at different companies and how exposed they are, so this is a breakdown. It's not as important that you can read all the company names, but I just took a, a survey of all the, or many of the IoT companies and how many ports they have open on the cloud. Just how big is the attack surface of these organizations in the cloud? And there's one big standout up here, it's Western Digital. So Western Digital, they're trying to pitch themselves as an IoT cloud drive. So you don't need to, you just outsource all the data storage to them and they take care of it, yada yada. What surprised me was they're running Telnet in the cloud. That's actually very impressive because 
you know, if you go to Amazon, it doesn't even come with Telnet. So these guys, they like, they really love Telnet. It's like, we need to manage everything with Telnet. I'm like, okay, okay. And they also had Memcache, they had VNC, they have all this other crap running on the cloud. So nobody was quite as bad as them, but everybody had a decently sized attack surface in the cloud. And yeah, just a total breakdown. You know, at least a third of the vendors were vulnerable in some way to some SSL issue. And now I want to start talking about more the hardware side of things. And I'll break it down into the consumer IoT and the industrial IoT. I won't talk that much about industrial IoT since I gave a talk here a few years ago. I just want to mention a few things that have changed or haven't changed uh, for Modbus, or this is true for most industrial protocols, to be honest. The distribution is the US has the most, and Europe is kind of you know, also very exposed, but it fluctuates around. The interesting point remains that China and Russia have practically nothing connected to the internet. That is just, it's, it hasn't changed at all. We've added more protocols, we've added more coverage. We were first thinking that maybe Shodan was being biased in the types of protocols. So we started adding some other protocols that are only existing in certain regions. Nope, they are still not very connected. So whatever they're doing is working. Yeah, I mean, Switzerland has more than Russia. That is that's weird. Another thing that uh, surprised me a bit is how long a lot of these problems linger around. You know, same with Mirai, we have default passwords, you have all these things that just keep, keep coming back. And this is something that we added, I don't know, I want to say like early this year maybe, and somebody messaged me on Google saying, hey, I found this new vulnerability in these, you know, serial Ethernet adapters, you need to take a look at it, it's really bad, really, really bad. And so I Googled it, because I was like, has nobody else, this seems really bad. This is an issue with Lantronics converters. So they have a, a really cool service where if you forget your password, you just ask it, what's my password? And it's like, here you go. This is great. Like, you don't need to worry about passwords anymore. It's just like, and I'm serious. This is like you, you send it a packet and it just responds with a password. And you're like, okay, I, mean, I guess that's it. And my friend was like freaking out. He thought he found this like amazing, crazy thing. And it turned out it was actually discovered you know, four years ago, and a Metasploit module was added for it. This has been around for ages, ages. And it's still out there. Like tens of thousands of these things are out there. Right, I mean, I don't know what to say about that, but it's just, these things don't die, right? I, I don't know why they don't get patched or why they don't get fixed, but it's just, a lot of these problems are known. Every, I mean, I don't know whether we keep, just keep rediscovering it I don't know what happens. And we've also started looking at medical devices. And so I've only very limited data on this. And I don't have a good answer to why the data looks like this. But this is a breakdown of DICOM image servers. So DICOM is a medical protocol that is used for sharing images, like x-rays and things like that about patients in the hospital. And this is a breakdown of the publicly accessible servers. And, you know, U.S. being number one, uh, not surprising. But then Brazil and Iran and Turkey being next, I don't... If anybody here is in the medical industry and can explain that to me, I would really enjoy the answer, because I have no idea. I, I don't know why there are so many of these medical imaging services. I think I looked up Brazil, and they might have had an initiative with, like, a DICOM, a great company, but I don't have a good answer for that. Another trend that we've been seeing at Shodan is people are starting to move ports as a solution. Um, yeah, so here I, I, I highlight ICS because I thought it would be more topical. But, so in this case, people are starting to move Modbus from 502 to 503 in, a, in an attempt to not be indexed or not be discovered on the internet. This is a very bad idea. Um, so first of all, it's not that hard to discover that way. And second of all, when it comes to selecting a random port, what we've learned at Shodan is that people are very bad at being random. So like, you know, for um, SSH, people will pick 2222 as the non-standard port, or they pick 1111222233333. I mean, it's just, you can see a pattern, right? It's, it's really simple, it's really obvious. People are bad at being random. And yeah, just, just don't do this, it's a bad idea. 
I also think I, I just wanted to highlight this for this audience. Uh, as we've been tracking ICS on Shodan, you know, the, the good news is things haven't totally gone off the cliff. It's not the end of the world. We've seen slow growth in the terms of ICS devices that keep getting connected to the internet. So it's not getting really much better, but it's, it's not getting worse at an exponential rate. It's not following the trajectory of you know, IoT or other sort of consumer electronics that are falling more of an exponential curve. But there's still a lot of education that we need to do. So one of the protocols we added this year as well was uh, Omron Fins. And in our process of learning more about the protocol, we we're looking at the official vendor documentation. And I want to highlight here that this sentence, when a router is forwarding a TCP or a UDP port to an Omron PLC, the traffic is being delivered to a non-Windows-based operating system. This makes the PLC impenetrable to standard hacking methods. And then they go on explaining how you can open up your firewall and you, know, you don't need to worry about anything. So this was the official documentation. There's still some work to do apparently with some vendors to educate them that there's some problems in doing that. But I think the majority of big vendors have actually gotten the message. The other thing, we've been adding IPv6 to Shodan. And this was sort of, I, I got a surprising response to doing this. I had a few, quite a few security people email me complaining how dare I discover them on the IPv6. They're like, IPv6 is too big. Even if I have a public IPv6 address, I consider it private, so how dare you find me? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm used to getting this kind of response for IPv4 for you know, people who don't work in security or don't, you know, are fully up to speed with things, but th these were security people that were like, criticizing being exposed in IPv6. And this IP address, I don't think it's still active anymore, but this was an ICS. This was an ICS on IPv6. So you really cannot rely on IPv6 for security. Just please don't do it. Please. Just don't do it. Just add proper security. Don't, let's not continue the game of security by obscurity for a whole other generation, okay? We can do better than that. So that's all I'm going to talk about ICS. Now let me move on to the you know, I, IoT, which is all the rage nowadays. And it's really gone kind of off the cliff, right? People are super excited about IoT. It's like really cool. And if you haven't seen this before, this will solve all your problems. This is like the one thing you're going to go home and buy instantly because you love omelets. You love cooking eggs. And you're at work. You have a long day at work. You're hungry. You know, you, but you don't know whether you have enough eggs at home to make an omelet. Do you? I don't know. I'm freaking out right now. I don't know. <laughs> so you, you buy this device and, you know, you put your eggs in it and it'll tell you over your phone how many you have left. So you can just check your phone and be like, oh, I only have two left. Well, I better pick up more eggs, right? It's really good stuff. Really good. And, you know, you all laugh and it's very funny and whatnot. People loved this product. Like, people are like, this is amazing, you know, they're like, they, they realize it's not like a super, you know, it's like a real first world problem, but no, they loved it. But it actually had to be discontinued. And the reason wasn't because people didn't buy it. The reason was that um, the battery didn't function very well in the refrigerator. So the lifetime of it was like literally one day, you'd buy it, you'd use it, people were like, oh my God, this is amazing. But the next day, you can't check your eggs anymore. And I'm like, oh, damn it. Okay. Life is rough. Yeah. And we also have stuff like this where if you're really desperate and need to check YouTube in your kitchen, then you can do it. You know, it's just, or Twitter, whatever. I mean, in, in the US, we also have uh, washing machines that, you know, normally the old washing machines, you have just this kind of, you know, window where you can see into the washing machine as it, you know, twirls around. No, nowadays, we don't have the window anymore. You have a giant LCD display that does the same thing. And you're like, am I missing something here? Like, what? I don't, I don't get it, but that, that's what I've seen. And this is a feedback screen for a bathroom in a Singapore airport. So, you know, you're, you're in a bathroom, you, did your, you took care of business, and then when you're checking out, you're like, well, I, didn't, I need to review this, but I can't use Yelp, I mean, it doesn't really fit for this, so. So they, the company was friendly enough to provide a touch screen so you can be like, all right, this is a good experience, a good time. Yeah, it's just silly stuff. 
Um, when it comes to how people are interacting with IoT from Shodan's perspective, it's very similar to the story with ICS. So previously I've mentioned that for ICS, I was at the ICS village, and we saw very few people at the first ICS village three years ago actually being successfully able to talk Modbus or any ICS protocol with the PLCs. The majority just used typical web attacks. They were trying like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, like all the typical web stuff on a PLC, and obviously it didn't work, yada, yada, yada. So it was surprising to me that even at the DEF CON community, you didn't really see the sort of advanced hacking or interaction that you would have expected. Same with IoT. Right now, from Shona's perspective, the things people search for and care about in IoT are all web-based. They all care about finding a web server that they can pull up and interact with. You know, the next talk is going to be about MQTT and you know, the IoT protocols. And from our perspective, people really haven't looked at it yet at all on a you know, bigger scale. So that's definitely that's just an area that is probably, as the next speaker will say, just really ripe for exploitation, is completely insecure, but people aren't looking at it yet because I don't think they understand how to communicate with these new IoT protocols. And I experienced some of these IoT problems firsthand. I bought a TV from a local Walmart, and as I do with all my devices, I nmap it. And as I nmapped it with you know dash a to run all the scripts. I'm sorry for the quality, but it's my phone, it's very bad. But basically, I launched the update process and the menu by end mapping it. And I was like, okay, this is not very you know, confidence inspiring. And so I did some more investigation into this, and it turns out that this TV is made by Vizio. They decided to keep the debug port open for all their production TVs. So when you develop an app for your smart TV, as a developer, you need to have a remote port open so you can communicate with it and you can debug your application in real time, right? They never removed that ability in their production TVs. I've, been, I've messaged them, I've been talking about this for a while, they still haven't fixed it. The latest TVs you buy from Vizio still have the debug port enabled and you can remotely talk to it and have complete control over it. IoT things. Yeah, so this is a map of them. And in terms of numbers, the numbers still are not huge. So for a lot of these things, the world is not ending just yet. But we've seen significant growth, which is actually a bit confusing since I don't know why a lot of these IoT devices would be directly on the internet. I don't understand exactly what the use cases are for that, but it's happening. Probably because of some UPnP automated port forwarding. It's the most likely case. What I want to talk about now is SmartThings hubs. So SmartThings is a company bought by Samsung. They have a lot of fun lately. And SmartThings hub runs Telnet, of course, as you do if you run IoT. It's the protocol of choice. And it's a, their own custom implementation of Telnet. It's very simple, only one thread. And the reason they have it is for QA purposes. So if you have a problem with your hubs, you can call them, and they can remotely Telnet into your device and look at it and fix it, and, you know, it's, it's good customer service, it's really important. Um, but one of the problems is that the engineer who added it left the company. And so they decided that because they didn't know how to, like whether or not to remove the service, they just kept it around. It was too much of a risk to remove that because they were worried that something else might break, so they just kept the service in. Um, I have a friend at Samsung, and I told him about this, and he's like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll talk to them. You know, I'll notify them. And he did. And then with the next firmware update, the port was gone. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Wow, that's a really good turnaround time. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, what they did is move it to a different port. So they decided that I would never see it on like a higher port. And I was like, oh my God, this is, just, this is not going to work, guys. Um, so this is another case where they did decide not to fix it, just move it, right? Problem solved. And whenever I talk to security people at IoT, even now with Mirai, the first response is like, I don't really need to care as much because I'm never going to buy any IoT stuff. Like, my house will never have IoT, right? I'm going to you know, stay off the grid or whatever else. And my answer to that is you will not have a choice, right? So Samsung recently announced at the CES that all of their Samsung TVs are going to have the SmartThings hub built in. So whether you want to or not, you're going to become part of IoT. 
There is no, you know, there's no avoiding it. You're going to have skin in the game no matter what. So you better start thinking about these things. And IoT has a whole different set of principles. So normally, a lot of hardware vendors, they design things like a washing machine or a refrigerator. You're not going to replace it every year. But with IoT, they design it with sort of a planned obsolescence. They expect that people will replace these devices within like two, three years. And then we face problems like this. This is in England, where they bought all these cameras for a local town. They installed all the cameras, hooked them all to a network. They had a person to monitor the cameras, make sure nobody you know, does something fishy. But then they had a downsizing of the budget. The town couldn't afford to maintain all the cameras. So what they did is just they fired the people looking at the cameras. But they kept all the cameras connected, because you already paid for them. Keeping them connected is not that expensive. So you had all these cameras publicly connected to the internet for anybody with no, no supervision. And we've already seen stories like this. You know, this is a bit not as sexy nowadays with the Mirai botnet. But a refrigerator being used to send spam. You know, it's, it's very ironic. And in the US, we also had this, which was pretty big, actually, because printers were being used to send Nazi propaganda. So all of a sudden, all the universities around the US, they were printing Nazi material. And was, that was pretty big news for us. And then this is sort of a classic example, which I love. This is a billboard in uh, an upscale area of Atlanta, a you know, rich area. And I had to <laughs> blur this, because um, this is a goat's face image that was put on the billboard. Do not Google that word. And I just love it because it's so, so, you know, the, you're a driver, you walk by, you call the police, you're like, oh my gosh, like, I, I, you know, somebody has to take this down. So, so the police shows up and the police just goes there and you, you see that the police officer here is just like, <laughs> like, what the hell am I supposed to do? Like, this is, it's, it's a digital billboard. I don't know, right? And so they called the IT guy, and eventually he showed up, and he took it offline, and then went back online a week later, because they didn't actually fix anything, they just you know, removed the cable. Um, and to give you another sort of closer, in-depth look at some of these devices, this is a traffic camera. This is not a red light camera, this is a traffic camera, deployed by a private company. And what it does is it takes a picture of every car that drives through the intersection, records the license plate, and stores in a database. And they sell the database to law enforcement and towing companies and things like that. And of course, they're on the internet. So the ones I looked at were mostly deployed in Los Angeles and in Louisiana. And I looked at the protocol. And what happens is that if you see a camera like this, you can just send it a single packet. You say, uh, hello, I would like to get some image data, please. And it goes, sure. And it just sends you a stream of images. Like, no authentication, anything. And I was like, okay, well, that, that's pretty bad, but I don't really want to do OCR myself on all the images. That seems like a lot of work. And um, so I looked at the JPEG data in the stream, and they already do the work for you. So the highlighted red area, that's the license plate. So naturally, what I did is I built my own license plate database. Um, so basically, what I did, I was able to subscribe to all the cameras I found. And they just started sending me pictures and license plates. And uh, this is just a sort of feed of license plates that I collected. And I tried to obfuscate as much as possible, but it's just, it's really. It was very scary when I did this. This was very, you know, I, I talked to the EFF, I talked to some lawyers. You know, that's, I never released it publicly, obviously, because it was really creepy that I was able to do this with these sort of new devices. They, they collect so much information, and if you don't properly secure it, all of a sudden you have this giant you know, privacy nightmare. But you can do some really cool stuff with the data. And so these are some stats. I only ran for five days, I only looked at 100 cameras, and I got a uh, bit more than 60,000 unique license plates. And what I did, I tried to do some analysis of license plates, and I wrote a basic algorithm to find novelty license plates, I don't know how common they are here in Sweden, but in the US you can have a, a license plate that says, you know, Shodan, or something like that. Or like Cuisine. Yeah. Right. So you can see that. And then you can do stuff like this. Where you can find out how many cars have novelty license plates. I mean, this is, 
I think you're getting at the premise of what IoT is to the average consumer and why IoT is such a powerful message and so popular among businesses, even, even regular consumers. It's because you have the ability to collect and answer questions that you've never been able to answer before. Right? This is something that you can do now empirically with data collection. You don't need to guess, you need to call businesses. This is data that you collect automatically. And the, the answers you can have are just amazing. Like here, I looked at the universities needing toner. You can look at whatever you want. For ICS, this is, you, know, you can look at wind turbines on the internet, how much power they produce, which countries are buying them, how big are their wind farms, how many turbines are they using, how often do they patch, all these things you can measure. It's really powerful. And that's why I think no matter what you think, IoT is here to stay. The premise of a connected world is just too powerful a message and is too useful to many people that regardless of the security implications, we're going to have to find a way to make it work. And going back to Mirai on that note, I thought about Mirai a bit. And what I realized was this is really familiar. Like somebody compromising a lot of embedded devices because of default passwords, then using them to attack other things on the internet. That, that's exactly what the internet census 2012 was. This is uh, one person that logged into a half a million, I think it was routers with default credentials, installed Nmap on it and nmapped the entire internet. So what he did was very academic. The research was all published, all data is publicly available, but it's exactly the same thing. Default passwords were used, large botnet, everybody knew about it, nothing changed. I mean, default passwords are just not a new thing, right? It's, it's not a fancy attack. You know, there are, lot, there are a lot of problems we have in security now. It's like, you know, Rohammer, a lot of really fancy things. But Mirai was none of that. Mirai didn't even target, you know, all the things I talked about before with the IoT and the refrigerator and all these, you know, Nest and drop cams. It didn't even need to attack those things. It didn't even need to worry about the vulnerabilities in Smart Things Hub because it had, you know, whatever special platform, special port or something. This is just bare basics, right? There's nothing fancy about this. And the response from the Chinese vendor has been horrific. So they, they're saying that they're going to do a recall. And alongside it, they're also saying, well, anybody saying that you know, we were responsible for this attack, we're going to sue them. Oh, and by the way, it's the user's fault because it didn't change the password. Right? I, I, this feels like we're repeating history here a bit. And along that note, I have to ask myself, whether we as a security community have not done a good enough job spreading the message of what the actual problems are. Because the actual problems right now in IoT are not the kettles or the toasters. That's not what we're seeing with Mirai, right? So here I'm bringing up the VNC images because that's for Shodan. That's what a lot of people talk about in the news and things like that. But there are like you know, 10, 12,000 of these on the internet. Yes, it's bad that they're publicly available we need to take them down, we need to secure them. But there are much bigger fish to fry. So I think there's sort of a disconnect between the actual risk that certain devices expose and the sexiness that news sometimes desires. And to give you an idea of that, I gave an interview with CNBC. Um, it was for aptly called a segment, Rise of the Machines. Originally, they wanted to do a story on ICS. They wanted to do an expose in the US about how terrible ICS is, all the problems they're facing, yada, yada, yada. And I had an hour-long interview with Melissa Lee from CNBC. It was a great interview, I enjoyed it, it was fantastic. Half a year later, they come back to me. The producer calls me, I was like, hey, John, you know, I think we're gonna reshoot some parts of the segment. I was like, okay, yeah, fine. So they come back out, and this time, they want me to show pictures of webcams, of people in hospitals, things like that. I'm like, what, what is going on here? This is like a 180 from what we did before. And so I called the producer, and he said, yeah, we did some focus group testing. And we were not able to sell ICS security. It was not interesting to our audience. And so instead, they changed it to this, which was five-minute segments on the Google car, you know, five minutes on webcams, five minutes on you know, whatever ADD thing they had at the time. And for Shodan, we've seen the same thing. So the top is the traffic we received to the website 
after a Washington Post article, it was a five-page Washington Post article on ICS. After it was published, we got you know, at its peak, like almost 100,000 hits, which is not insane. And then CNN Money did a top 10 most dangerous things on the internet, and just like, you know, blows up like crazy. And that kind of speaks to our inability, I think, to effectively communicate some of these security problems. And so, finally, I want to say that our tools have never been better to understand security and spread the message. And we need to get better at translating our technical language into things that the average person understands. Otherwise, I'm not sure we're going to make much inroads into actually fixing these problems. And as an update to last time, last time I got zero abuse emails three years ago. Now we're less than 10. So for all the IoT scanning, for all the ICS scanning, for everything that we do in Shodan regarding to IoT and ICS, we've gotten less than 10 people emailing us about it. Just to give you an idea of how little visibility there is into this issue on the average network. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. So, yeah, this is also mind-blowing in a number of ways because, uh, I mean, the audience, even if the tools are better better, more and more people are interested in it, I feel the audience are more and more ignorant. They have, again, this feeling about we can do anything we like, and that is what we are doing because we don't really think about the consequences or the implications on people or... I mean, unfortunately... Um, security is usually a reactive measure, mm -hmm. not proactive. I mean, same with you know, ICS, even now, I mean, not as much with after Mirai, but whenever people approach me and ask me, well, if ICS is so bad and there are so many of these things on the internet, why haven't we seen an, an attack with them yet? Why haven't we seen anybody actually yeah. exploit these yeah. things? That question has partially been answered now with Mirai. Yeah, it has, which is good. Yeah, I, I, it's For good, but also sad that it always yeah. takes that. Yeah. But speaking of this egg um, checker thing, I noticed in an article the other day that there is now a diaper that will tweet to the parent when the baby soils or wet itself. And probably that is the only way to get the parents' attention from, you know, the mobile phone. So it might be a good solution to that. I've seen one a mattress as well that detects if uh, somebody is, you know, using it while you're not home to detect infidelity if your partner's cheating on you. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's a very not, important not use case. Not just having an app. Yeah, yeah. yeah right, right. So yeah. if we just look at that screen, who's most responsible for securing the IoT, do you think? And there's uh, the vendors or, no, what was it for, manufacturers? Yeah, I, I was vendors. expecting majority would yeah. answer uh, vendors. I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear from the people that think the users are responsible for IoT. I don't know whether anybody here is brave enough to speak up, but that's, that's surprising to me. You want the benefits, you have to care, take care of the risks. You want them to be part of the... Now, if they want to have the benefits of IoT, they also should think about the risks. But do you think that's been an effective way in every other I area think of... In the sector, because what do you think? <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Well, fair enough. But still, I think we right. buy things that we believe are tested and safe and prove to be good for us in a very open manner. So. Um, it's a little bit unfair to put the responsibility on the consumer, I should say, but what do I know? We can see if we have got some uh, questions here. Can you recommend some IoT-specific ports and protocols we should research in Shodan? Uh, yes, MQTT, what the next guy is talking about. Hey, we will uh, that, hear that more about that. needs desperately. Uh, the other one is co-op. So there are two main I uh, IoT protocols that are really interesting right now. It's MQTT and co-op. Um, I think the majority of his talk is going to be about MQTT. Co-op is very similar. Uh, it's, there's a lot of research to be done in that area and a lot of dangerous discoveries. And since I think people like what you're doing, how can we contribute to Shodan? So we actually have a GitHub repository for some IoT fingerprints. If you find any IoT devices, like for example, I think in Sweden you have Smartson, uh, smart TVs. Oh, yes. Like, uh, like you know... Region-specific IoT yeah. devices, if you can just end map them, fingerprint them, and either email us or up, you know, send a pull request to GitHub, that'd be very appreciated. So we can start fingerprinting and indexing these devices and get a better understanding for every region of how exposed IoT is.
Yeah, go hack your homes because pretty we have much. a lot of smart things there. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, just for personal curiosity, you should always end map all devices you buy because you might be surprised. Can we have a hand up? How many does that? I can tell I won't. Yeah, a lot of yeah, people that's like that. That's pretty number. good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I'm sorry that to disappoint you about uh, the TLS HTTPS. I'm, yeah, I sh Sweden. We should do better. Blame on you. Shame on you. Not really you. But yeah, probably not you guys as much. But no. Shame on you. So how long time does it take to scan the IP6 range? <laughs> okay, how long that is question? the string? <laughs> Obviously, we don't scan the entire IPv6 range. <laughs> so we have a variety of methods for doing host discovery. Mm -hmm. um, but it, obviously, we, we can't brute force it. That's just ah, that's true. Uh, so we, that, we keep track yeah. of, I think, around 80 million IPv6 addresses right now. And it's very small. It's only 80 million, so we can scan very fast. Mm, but still, yeah. And I think there was, uh, what will be the next? Will there be any vacuum cleaners in Shodan shortly? Or will you stop with the refrigerator? Or we already have tea kettles. OK. So like, <laughs> I expect everything that has network port or network connectivity is going to be it's at some point in yeah. Shodan. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And I will just <laughs> hand over to you oh. the certificate of appreciation. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. And here's a small gift. And I can take the clicker right, from yep. you. Hand it just off to me. Sure. So, thank you. A big right. applause. Oh.